one of the more prolific poets of the uh, of the late Middle Ages was a Welshman, Defid Ap Gwilym, <clears throat> who uh, wrote a, uh, a remarkable number of short lyrics during the uh, during the 14th century. He spans lifetime span, uh, I think, 60 years of the 14th century, and he produced somewhere just shy of. Uh, about 200 or so. Uh, they, uh, we don't know very much about him. We know very little about him, honestly. Uh, but his name is attached to a bunch of these. And there's some others of uncertain origin that uh, maybe he was attached to, maybe he wrote, or maybe he helped with. It's all a little uncertain. But he was part of what was a uh, significant poetic community in Wales at the time, writing in Welsh at a time when um, there was some significant nationalist fervor against the English, let's say. <clears throat> and he was remarkable as well for his subject matter and his, uh, his particular voice. He uh, generally uh, stayed away from the flat devotional uh, uh, poetry of so many other uh, poets of the late Middle Ages. There's, uh, you can find certainly some, uh, some devotional uh, themes and images and stuff like that. But for the most part, he, uh, he, he was writing about nature and himself. Uh, he, he could be a lot of fun. He could be very bawdy. Um, <clears throat> But uh, but it was a remarkably uh, proto-humanist, I would say, uh, vision of reality. Lots of uh, lots of natural imagery, lots of uh, appreciation of the world around us, as opposed to the world beyond, and a uh, particularly individualized voice. He's always a person looking around in the world and his personality, strong as it was, shines through. And so you get a, uh, a, a remarkable, um, <clears throat> a remarkable character on the poetic stage. One of the, uh, one of the, uh, one of the better versions of, uh, his natural, uh, inclinations shows up in the poem The Fox. Uh, you can read it allegorically, although it's, uh, once you go into that realm, it can be a little bit complicated to say what anything means. But the the simple engagement with, with nature is really what's, uh, what's pretty remarkable here. And the way he seems to identify with the fox and be a little bit, uh, uh, of nature and yet outcast from it. Yesterday was I, sure of pur purpose, under the trees, alas that the girl doesn't see it, standing under Ovid's stems and waiting for a pretty girl beneath the trees. She made me weep on her way. I saw when I looked, th when I looked there an ape's shape where I did not love, a red fox. He doesn't love our hound's place, sitting like a tame animal on his haunches, near his den. Uh, first stanza, sets up a problem, uh, introduces a character, the, uh, the, uh, the, the man waiting. He is very characteristically for David, waiting for a young girl, uh, perhaps a little love grotto. Uh, and he notices something curious about nature. A fox wanders into his vision. And so you have these two, uh, two characters, essentially, at this point, regarding one another in a way. But we're not sure exactly what the fox is doing there. I drew between my hands a bow of you there. It was brave about, like an armed man, on the brow of a hill, a stirring of high spirits, weapon for coursing along a district, to hit him with a long, stout bolt. I drew for a try a shaft, clear past the jaw. My grief, my bow went in three pieces, luckless disaster. I got mad. I did not dread him, unhappy bear at the fox. He's a lad who's a lo who'd love a hen, a silly bird, and a bird in bird flesh. He doesn't follow the cry of horns, 
Rough his voice and his carol, ruddy is he in front of the talus's slope, like an ape among green trees. At both ends of the field there turn up a dog shape looking for a goose, crow's beacon near the brink of the hill, acre strider, color of ember, color of an ember, likeness of a lure for crows and magpies at a fair, portents looking like a dragon, portent looking like a dragon. Lord of excitement, chewer of a fat hand, of acclaimed fleece, glowing flesh, an owl of how an all of hallowed out fine earth, fire dish at an edge of a shuttered window, copper bow of light feet, tongues like a beak of blonde. Not easy for me to follow him and his dwelling towards Anwin. Red Roamer, he was found to be too fierce. He'd run ahead or of, of a course of hounds. Sharp is rushing, gorse strider, leopard with a dart in his rump. A uh, lot going on here. A lot of a uh, lot of action. Let's say uh, it's it's a little uncertain again if uh, what kind of allegorical reading you could get out of this. What kind of symbolism? The fox is clearly uh, involved in a hunt, but clearly so also is in a way the. Um, uh, the, the, the poet, the voice of the poet, who is hunting for this young girl, or at least waiting to snare her. Uh, there's a, there's a certain joy in the, uh, in the hunt, there's a certain, uh, animal revelry, the, uh, the, the passion of the red is dwelled upon sometimes, the color of an ember, a uh, kind of uh, intensity perhaps, a kind of heat. Uh, there is a love of the moment that is quite striking. Um, I got mad, I did not dread him, unhappy bear at the fox. He's a lad who'd love a hen, a silly bird and bird flesh. He doesn't follow the cry of horns, rough his voice and his carol. His carol, uh, his song, uh, rough his voice. Perhaps David is projecting a little here. The, uh, the, the fox suddenly has uh, a, a bit of a, uh, an outcast persona rough his voice and his carol. He's a little too coarse, perhaps. Um, he doesn't follow the cry of horns. He is a uh, perhaps a rebel, perhaps very independent, uh, and his voice is very rough. Maybe this is David describing himself. Maybe he is imagining himself as the fox. I often wonder if this is an indication, and again, we don't know very much about the man. I often wonder if this is an indication that maybe he has red hair. Perhaps he does. Welshman, it's not uncommon. But the, uh, the curiosity of this, uh, this moment is really what strikes me. The idea that he, uh, he is just sitting there minding his own business, waiting for a little uh, love visit, and all of a sudden something in nature grabs him, and he sits there and he just dwells on it for a minute, and he is invested in it in a way that belies uh, Christian uh, traditionalism of the Middle Ages, where, again, it's, it's an anti-material age. You're not supposed to be particularly caught up in the stuff of this world you're supposed to be projecting onto the next world. And so when he dwells on, well, you know, what is, what's this moment like for that fox? What is life like for that fox? Well, how can I identify with that fox? Why would you bother if you're supposed to be projecting onto the next life? Why would you bother identifying or, or uh, speculating? about the life of a fox, the life of anything in nature. It's, um, it's very uncertain. It's very unsettling. Uh, the, um, the bow went in three pieces, luckless disaster. Uh, there is something, I mean, you can maybe read into, well, he, uh, he was waiting for a woman or a 
girl, probably, uh, and this fox wandered in, maybe this is a young red-headed girl who strode in. Not sure, uh, but he tried to draw his bow and it just sort of fell apart in his hands. Luckless disaster. Um, hmm, what could that mean? Uh, there are a couple of things going on here, and I, I don't want to dwell too much on them. But suffice it to say, uh, he would not be uh, out of turn with his own corpus in talking about stuff like that. A lot of his stuff, uh, a lot of his poems involve uh, a, uh, a character of some uh, fervent fleshliness, let's say. And, uh, and he is an entertainer at heart. The, the poems are a lot of fun. And uh, he sees nothing wrong, and then maybe there is nothing wrong, with uh, celebrating some of, the, uh, some of the earthly pleasures that, uh, that, uh, that he can find around him. One of them, he, uh, he, uh, he, uh, he, he, he has a very nice poem about a bar fight, quite frankly. Uh, the Trafith Mune Tefam means trouble at the inn. I won't trouble you with, uh, uh, with my trying to pronounce Welsh, and I certainly won't read any of the originals, but they are available online, and they are a lot of fun. But it's a fun poem about, you know, uh, what, what you would imagine was a fairly frequent occurrence in, uh, in David's life of finding himself in a bar and striking up a acquaintance with a young girl and ending up in a bit of a fight. I came to a choice town followed by my handsome page boy, fine, merry expense, an excellent place for dinner. I took a pretty dignified public lodging. I was proud, fine. I was a proud, fine young man, and had some wine. I spotted a fair, slender maid in the house, my one fair sweetheart. I set my mind entirely upon my slender darling, color of the rising sun. Uh, another redhead there, by the way. I bought roast and expensive wine, not to show off. For me and the beauty over there, young men love playing games. I called the girl, a modest maid, to me on the bench, and we had a very grand dinner, greater than a wedding feast. I whispered, I was a bold, diligent man, that's for sure, two alluring words. After the obstacle was cleared by the whispering, close fate, I made an agreement. Love was not idle or easy. To come to the lovely girl when the crowds had gone to sleep, she was a dark-browed beauty. When everyone except me and the girl had gone to sleep, exceedingly piteous, I tried most adeptly to make my way to the girl's bed, but it turned out disastrously. I had a nasty fall making a commotion there. There was no good there were no good feats. I hurt my shin, my poor leg. I didn't jump safely above the ankle on the edge of the stupid of the stupid shrill stool because of the innkeeper. I hit my forehead. Excessive desire is bad. Where I ended up without without any free leap, frequent confusion of wild crashing on the end of the table, where there was a loose basin now and a noisy brass pan, the table fell a heavy piece, and the two trestles of all the and all the utensils, the pan let out a clang. It could be heard a long way behind me. The basin boomed. I was a vain man, and the dogs barked. It's easier to get up awkwardly, foolish wickedness, than swiftly. I came up. It was a it was a remorseful tale. Welshmen love me. By the thick walls there where there were three Englishmen in one stinking bed worrying about their three packs, Hicken and Jenkin and Jack. The churlish slobber chops, cruel hate hissed to the other two. There's a Welshman, fierce, deceitful com commotion, roaming around here most cunningly. He's a thief if we allow it. Watch out. Keep clear of him. The innkeeper roused up all the host, and it was a woeful tale. Nine at a time they searched for me, scowling all around me, whilst I, covered in painful bruises, kept quiet in the darkness. I prayed, not in fearful fashion, in hiding like one afraid, and though 
and through the power of dear sincere pr prayer and through the grace of Jesus I got back, sleepless confusion, without any gain to my own lair. I escaped, thank goodness that saints are close by, and be I beg to God for forgiveness. <laughs> Um, he found religion at the very end, a very common theme, let's say, in, uh, in, in medieval pious poetry. Um, but the journey to that uh, revelation is perhaps a little bit more raucous, a little bit more coarse. Um, coarse. The, uh, the, the, the story is very cute. You could see that this was probably written for a... Uh, a crowd of like-minded people, perhaps also to be uh, to be sung in a tavern, something that's a little bawdy, something that's a little bit uh, raucous, and uh, and and it's very entertaining and funny along the way. You get a little uh, uh, peek in there of the hostility, the nationalistic hostility between the Englishmen and the Welshmen. You get the. Uh, the somewhat easy morals of the tavern crowd uh, that uh, is clearly the milieu that this poet is used to working in or, or associating with and only turns to the, the, the pious life of, uh, of Christianity at the very end when things don't quite work out for him and he kind of casts up his fate. Uh, it's like, oh, well, the only reason I didn't go and, you know, score with that, uh, with that girl is because, uh, God had it out for me for that one moment or something like that, or that God saved me from, uh, from further beating by the, uh, by the angry mob in the, in the crowd. Um, it's, it, there's not a lot to, uh, really dig into in this. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty on the surface, <clears throat> but it's fun. And in that fun, you can see uh, a, that early stirring of humanism as, uh, as people suddenly discover that they're allowed to have fun, that they don't all have to be suffering in, uh, in loathing of the worldly pleasures around them uh, while contemplating the, the divinity beyond, but that pleasure is here for all of us and that we should be, uh, enjoying it from time to time. And, uh, we shouldn't feel bad about that. Uh, his most, David's most famous, let's say, or infamous, notorious perhaps poem is, uh, is more or less in that vein uh, there's a little pun there. It is, uh, well, he writes a poem about, uh, his, his penis <laughs> or the penis. The, the title is the penis. Uh, so it's not just his, it is a universal penis, if you will. Um, and he imagines, uh, um, uh, it, it as the object of some, uh, criminal indictment, if you will. Uh, and here it gets a little, uh, it, it goes more than a little body, I would say. It is filled with uh, lots of little jokes and puns and, uh, and frankly, you know, it, well, you get the idea of the vernacular. In the modern age, it would be considered... Uh, uh, it, it's easy. Well, it is easy to discount the, uh, the, the value of this poem or the meaning of this poem, um, because it is such a, uh, because of what, because of its subject matter, let's just say that. But again, you have to admire the, uh, the attention to the natural world to the world of humanity in its most naked form, um, to physical pleasure, to the enjoyment of, uh, of, of, of animal lusts, and also the, uh, the enjoyment of laughter, quite frankly. The whole thing is a joke. So the idea of laughter at one's humanity and a kind of uh, joyful irreverence 
to it uh, in the face of you know stern uh, uh, Christianized, let's say, morality um, is is somewhat uh, fun. Anyway, uh, the penis. By God's penis, you must be you must be guarded with eye and hand because of this lawsuit, straight-headed pole, more carefully than ever now. Uh, not saying that word, net quill, because of complaint, a bridle must be put on your snout to keep you in check so that you are not indicted again. Take heed, you despair of minstrels. To me, you are the vilest of rolling pins, scrotum's horn. Do not rise up or wave about. Gift, gift to the noble ladies of Christendom, nut pole of the lapsed cavity, and snare shape, gander sleeping in its yearling plumage, neck with a wet head and milk giving shaft, tip of a growing shoot. Stop your awkward, jerking, crooked, blunt one, accursed pole, center pull, pillar of a girl's two halves. Head of a stiff conger eel with a hole in it, blunt barrier like a fresh hazel pole. You are longer than a big man's thigh, a long night's roaming, chisel of a hundred nights, auger like a post shaft, leather-headed one who is called tail. You are a crowbar which, is, which causes lust, the bolt of the lid of the girl's bare arse. There's a tube in your head, a whistle for, I'm not saying that word every day, there's an eye in your pate which which finds every woman fair, rounded pestle, extended gun. There is a purgatorial file, fire for a small, not saying that word, thatching stick of girls' laps. The swift growth, growth is the clapper of a bell, blunt pod, I dug a fa it dug a family, snare of skin, nostril on a crop of two testicles. You are a trouser full of wantonness, your neck is leather. Image of a goose's neck bone, completely deceitful disposition, pod of lewdness, doornail, which, which causes a lawsuit and trouble. Consider that th that there is a writ and an indictment. Bow your head, stick for planting children. It's difficult to keep you under control. Miserable thrust, you are woeful indeed. Your master is frequently rebuked. The rottenness through your head is obvious. Um, so there, that's, um, that's something now, isn't it? Uh, the, uh, the, there is perhaps a, uh, a little tinge of misogyny running through there. Um, it is significant, I would say also that, uh, this is a, uh, censorious tone. It is clearly a satire, but... Uh, perhaps the poet is dwelling upon the idea that we are somewhat, uh, as a species, uh, slay, enslaved to our, uh, our sexual desires. This is clearly an overwhelming thing. The, the dwelling on the image after the image after the euphemism after the euphemism of all of this uh, that is, uh, is perhaps indicative of well, humanity's a uh, problem where we are obsessed with uh, sexual urges, where we uh, are are constantly dwelling upon them, and that is a uh, that is of course an impediment to uh, the the proper association with uh, with Christianity and the focus on the other world. So you could go that route with it, but clearly also he's just having a lot of fun. Uh, this is another one you can easily imagine him reciting in a bar and uh, engaging with uh, some uh, some of his fellow poets and perhaps this is this almost reads like something he wrote as a bit of a dare uh, not a serious poem so much as just trying to uh, see how many <laughs> uh, euphemisms he can jam into a lyric but again, you got to come back to the fun, the the simple joy of language, uh, the simple joy of imagery, of poetry, um, joy in this world and not the next. That's a uh, 
Oh, that is a focus that is in all so short supply in the Middle Ages and in the waning of the Middle Ages. Uh, in, in Wales, which is fairly removed from, uh, uh, from the, the heart of the Renaissance, um, Chaucer was walking around at this point, uh, and, uh, uh, actually he was probably dead by the time this was written, but maybe, um, and, uh, there, well, actually no, but the, um, the, the, the heart of the Renaissance was still just starting to bubble up in Italy a few, uh, you know, several hundred miles west or east, but the, uh, the urge was there. The inclination to look around and say, well, okay, um, we're not all bad. Life's not that terrible. There's some stuff to celebrate here. Uh, that was, uh, a dawning revelation for a lot of people at the time. And Daphid in the late middle ages was just starting to tap into that and see the future, which is a future of humanism.